Um, I'm very excited uh, to be launching the KPMO Gut Barrier Panel. Uh, some of you have been aware that we've been working on this for a number of uh, years now. So again, uh, we're launching this on September the 6th uh, for the rest of the world, uh, Labor Day for the US market. So the idea is uh, we want to get this out uh, and share this with everyone. And as part of that, um, we thought we'd record a short video of myself uh, and more importantly, Dr. Rob Silverman um, to talk about some of the different elements on the panel and how he's going to use it uh, and uh, considers using it from a clinical perspective. So again, the key with this test is we're going to talk a little bit about the FIT test, uh, which again is looking at food sensitivities with, with the IgG1 through 4. It's looking at the inflammation with the C3D, and that's our patented test that we have. So we're unique in the world that no one else has a patented IgG and complement test uh, available. And now, very excitingly, we're adding the gut permeability panel as well. So that makes us really, again, stand out versus some of the other companies in, in, the, in the field. And the idea is to make sure we kind of combine those two as we roll that out. So we'll get Dr. Rob to give an overview of the gut barrier panel. But what I thought I'd do is just give a background on why we decided to look at the gut barrier panel. When we first launched about 10 years ago, we were very happy to have a unique food sensitivity test in terms of being patented with the IgG1 through 4 and the complement, looking at um, the different elements within the food sensitivity wor world, which gave us that true marker of inflammation. When I was out uh, initially selling this product to people, I was hearing on a pretty regular basis uh, from providers saying, I don't necessarily test my patients for food sensitivity because I think they have leaky gut. And so that kind of stuck in my mind a bit in terms of there was a, a, a kind of cohort of providers out there who weren't necessarily testing, they were guessing to see what was going on. And as I thought about testing and guessing, I thought the only person that we should really be talking about with that is Dr. Rob with his book about making sure you test, not guess. So without further ado, what I thought I'd do is hand over to Dr. Rob to go through um, the new KBMO gut barrier panel. Thanks so much, James. I'm happy to be here. And I do believe that the FIT test, without question, now adding the gut barrier panel is the most comprehensible, accurate test on the market today. And it does allow you to test and not guess within your patient's uh, scope of issues. Um, I really like the slide before it as a note, because again, what's first? Well, the bottom line is, is it leaky gut or is it a food sensitivity? Well, if you have food sensitivities, you can have leaky gut. If you have leaky gut, you can have food sensitivities. But what's most important is when you're looking at this gut barrier panel, what really makes the KBMO test stand out is its ability to test for IgG 1 through 4 and C3D. Now, this IgG 1 through 4 is in that adaptive immune system. Now, many companies test IgG 1 and 2. The uniqueness to doing one and four is that IgG3 tests for the complement inflammatory pathway. So here you have a food sensitivity, and now you're testing the innate immunity, and you're also testing the adaptive immunity with the antibody. So you really know that that food sensitivity is lighting you up through your immune system. Now you've also added the IgA and you've added IgA one through two, secretory IgA, which we know is an antibody at the mucosal uh, lining. You're really getting a full composite and it's becoming more and more revealing to the patient's condition. So you're testing for candida, zonulin, and occludin. And again, the FIT test, the food inflammation test is quite interesting in that food sensitivities are very important because of that long delay from ingestion, 72 hours, to symptomology coming out. So there's no doctor or patient that can really point at that food. So um, I know you had some specific questions you wanted me to go over, but there was something of note that you wanted to make about the test. Yeah, I mean, I think when we pulled this uh, panel together, obviously, we, we talked to quite a lot of experts in the field on it. But, you know, and one of the key things that kind of kept coming back to us was that this area is kind of like a continuum. It's not just a single marker kind of catch all thing. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to look at the three paths panel marker in terms of the candida, the zonulin and the occludin. But also what we wanted to look at is the, uh, as Dr. Rob mentioned, is the secretory IgA, because, again, we haven't included that in the in the fit test before, 
because again, one of the neat things about our multiple panel, multiple um, pathway approach is it gives us a way of really zeroing in on the key foods of interest. So generally we'll only see five to 15. Uh, and again, the report's nice and simple as well with the three pages. So the idea was to make sure that we kind of continued that approach of trying to be comprehensive to give as much information with the gut barrier panel that would then kind of uh, tailor very nicely in with our food sensitivity test. And so to that end, both the FIT 132 and our FIT 176, when we launch this test on September 6th, will include this gut barrier panel. So again, it won't be any additional price. It will be included with the FIT 132 and the 176. So again, just to also highlight um, those three markers, you can say, well, I could get those from a number of players. With this zonulin, it's absolutely unique to KBMO Diagnostics. So Dr. Dorval and our R&D team, uh, with the help of uh, Dr. Alessio Pisano, have spent the last four years working uh, on developing a unique zonulin assay to KBMO Diagnostics, which you are probably aware that we launched back in uh, earlier this year in March. The key thing about this assay, it has a unique recombinant zonulin protein, which enables us to make sure it doesn't cross-react with haptoglobin and properdin. And as well as that, it makes sure we see a much better positivity rate. In fact, it really is mirroring, really interestingly enough, um, the initial work that Dr. Pisano did uh, that was published in his Lancet letter in early 2000. So I just wanted to highlight that fact that you could potentially say, well, I can get candida and zonulin and occludin from other places, but you can't get the zonulin from anyone else but KBMO. And so again, it's dealt with a number of those issues that other zonulin assays have been struggling with, i.e. the low positivity rate, the cross-reactivity with the haptoglobins, the properdins, and frankly, other complement fragments as well. So that's what's unique about this test. And that's why we're excited to add it as part of that continuum, as we talked about with the candida, the zonulin, uh, and the occluded. So as we've been looking to talk to different people about the testing, we've heard a number of different questions. So I thought the best person to get on and talk about this would be Dr. Rob. So Dr. Rob, what I thought would be helpful if you could just kind of give the providers and patients a quick explanation or an easy to understand explanation uh, on the candida, zonulin and occludin. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the IGA one and two and why we've added both of those as well. So the candida, as, you, as everybody knows, is a yeast. So having a certain amount is not a problem. It's the overgrowth that poses an issue. So um, it's a type of yeast that normally lies in small amounts in different parts of your body, like your mouth, your skin, and of course your gut. But when the environment is right, the yeast can multiply and grow out of control. It typically occurs when good bacteria is suppressed and obviously the bad bacteria overtakes. We call that dysbiosis and the leveling of good and bad bacteria and or when your immune system is weakened. So candida really is a sign of a multitude of things and it's a great early marker for um, unleveling in the gut and possibly compromise of the gut. When we get more involved, we look at zonulin. Now, zonulin is a protein that can open tight junction proteins. And two that are main triggers for zonulin release are gliadin, which is a protein from gluten, and intestinal bacteria. Now, zonulin and occludin, the way I like to express it is, I'm gonna interlock my fingers, I'm gonna put my hands together. Each hand is uh, an epithelial cell. The fingers, are actually the strings that hold the epithelial cell, if I can make this vivifying for you. Zonulin is the pull on the epithelial cells. So that tight junction becomes a little loose and that happens during the day. But what happens with occludin, it's these, if you will, shoestrings and these fibers that hold it together. When the fibers break, occludin goes up. So zonulin, is more of a functional aspect of the tight junction and occluding is more of a structural compromise. That said, the overview of zonulin is very interesting. It's a protein that's synthesized in intestinal and liver cells. It's a key biomarker for intestinal permeability. It's the only regulator or reversible regulator of intestinal permeability and elevated levels of zonulin are associated with a lot of conditions like celiac, autoimmune, uh, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, obesity, multiple sclerosis, and more. 
But when you compare and contrast it with occludin, occludin is the first transmembrane protein of epithelial type junctions that was discovered. It has 15 years of evidence, which indicates that occludin plays an important role in the regulation of tight junction integrity. One of the key clinical gems that I like to share with everybody is occludin is essential in tight junction stability and barrier function. Together, as I did before, zonulin and occludin are gatekeepers of the tight junction proteins when functioning properly. They actually prevent large food molecules from crossing the intestinal barrier going into the bloodstream where they can elicit an immune response. So, um, Jed, did you want to add anything on that? Because you have a couple of behind the scenes views on that before we tackle the IgA and some of the protocols? Yeah, and, and, and I think we, we looked at adding candida and we've had that for a while. And so that's a great you know, explanation and, and kind of patients and providers have often been confused. So hopefully that helps with the candida. As we talked about the zonulin again, I think that's a great description. It's that functional uh, explanation. So it's the function of the tight junctions, whereas as you say, occluding is more structural. And I think that's really, when you start adding those three together, you've got the candida with the dysbiosis, which you mentioned, the zonulin with the tight function, and now the occluden. So again, hopefully everyone saw your uh, the kind of description in terms of uh, on the screen as well, which I think really helps kind of bring that together in terms of why you'd look at the three, given as we've talked about, it's a continuum, it's not just a single marker. And so that was the idea of putting those three together. So again, we've always looked at IgG1 through four and complement, we wanted to add IgG because it's a creatory market, but what I wanted to do is get Dr. Rob explain why the IgA and then why the IgA one and two, Dr. Rob. Well, IgA is a very unique antibody in that it plays a role in immune function of mucous membranes. We call it secretory IgA because it serves as the first line of defense in protecting intestinal epithelium from enteric toxins and pathogenic microorganisms. IgA 1 and 2 are critical. I mean, some people test for one or the other. You want to test for both. IgA 1 compromises about 85% of the IgA concentration. IgA 1 shows a good immune response to protein enzymes. When you compare and contrast that with IgA 2, which represents only about 15% of the total IgA, but it plays a critical role in the gastrointestinal tract to fight against lipopolysaccharide antigens. So when you combine them together, you're really getting a full, if you will, complement of things to test for. So now you've got antibodies, you've got complement, and you're looking at the secretory level. So many people ask, well, what does that mean? What does it reveal? What do you do with that information, Dr. Rob? Well, if you're seeing that you have candida elevated, but not zonulin or occludin, you may want to use something like caprylic acid, oregano oil, berberine, garlic. And for me, maybe the uh, gold medal winner is serum bovine immunoglobin, what I like to refer to as the mop of the gut to take pathogens and antigens out. So now you know specifically what supplements to do. And of course, many of the diets are similar in the gut, low sugar, low carbohydrates, no gluten, no dairy, no food sensitivities. Also, which probiotic, which strain? Probiotics are strain specific. For candida, we use lactobacilli strain, producing lactic acid and um, being real positive against fungal compounds. It lowers the pH in the gut and makes the environment less enjoyable or um, less hospitable for candida. Remember, we want to be an inhospitable host for pathogens in our gut. Zonulin is a little different. The probiotic that I would recommend for zonulin, the data indicates this, is B. longum. Zinc carnosine is great for tight junction damage. It also activates the NRF2 pathway. It's known to lessen gut-induced gut permeability and enhances tight junction formation and stability. Some of the other typical um, suspects that are used very regularly and effectively for tight junction and our gut damage is L-glutamine, collagen peptides, curcumin, and glucosamine HCL. So they're very similar, zonulin and occludin, in what you would use to heal them. The real difference maker is the time. Obviously, zonulin won't take as long as occludin because it's a structural fault. Yeah, that, that's a great description in terms of the, the different things you could use. And as I say, I think what we're looking at doing now is, is really trying to split hopefully that um, 
those two different pathways as it were. So if there's nothing coming up on the gut barrier panel, then you can look at straightforward inflammation. If there's something, any of the markers come up on the uh, gut barrier panel, then you can look at some kind of gut healing protocol. So the idea now is it gives you much more clarity around what you do in terms of how you treat that patient in terms of now with the gut barrier panel included, as well as the food sensitivity. Back to Dr. Rob's point about not guessing testing, this will give you the evidence that then will lead into a much, hopefully much more cl clarity in terms of the path of supplementation that you wanna go with the patient that you're, uh, you're looking at as you review the result. Q, review the result. So, um, the neat thing is we have a three-page report. So again, um, some poor patient sent me a 76-page food sensitivity report the other day. Uh, the idea with KBMO is to try and keep it simple so busy providers can take advantage of that, the simplicity of the report, but way more importantly, so can the patient. Because again, we've all been there where patients have been slightly like deer in the headlights when it comes to reviewing results. What we want to do is make sure it's accessible to the patient and the provider. So the first page, as you'll all be aware, is shows which foods are sensitive, the patient may be sensitive to. The second page remains the Manhattan in terms of showing by depth various groupings. But thirdly, which I think is really exciting now, is we've added the gut barrier panel as a standalone page. Uh, and on that, what you'll see is a really clear way of kind of describing what's positive, what's negative. And so we've given, um, Dr. Uh, yeah, Dr. Rob's given a great explanation of the candida, the zonulin, and the occludin uh, on this on this talk, but we've just put, put written something down here so the patient's got an understanding of it as well. Uh, and under zonulin, there's another uh, more detailed talk that we've done on the zonulin given, as I mentioned, that's unique to KVMO, and so we've gone through that on our website in the occludin. And the other important element we've also added is um, interpretation of this gut barrier panel. So what we're recommending if any of these six markers are elevated, that you need to talk to your provider about going on some kind of gut healing protocol, which I'm sure will be based around a number of those great supplement uh, ideas that uh, Dr. Rob's just talked about. So Dr. Rob, what's your thought about this new report? Well, as I said before, I believe it's the most comprehensive, accurate uh, panel. It's what I rely on in my office. But what I really like about it in its simplest form is the colors. So Patients know when they see it go, wow, look at the range. So let's look at red and green. So the idea of red means stop and reboot and restart. Green means positive, continue to go forward with it. So it speaks volumes. And then with the numbers, when you're looking at the food sensitivity, people understand the range or the spectrum like you've always said. And then when you get to the gut panels, um, it's very simple. You know, you're having negative and positive. So, but if you notice that the positive is red, once again, stop, let's reboot, let's fix it, let's restructure. Now you can tell that you have sensitivities, you also have some additives there, and you can have, you know, different issues within the gut and damage to the gut lining. Again, for me, 80% of your immune cells are in your gut. It's where your macro and micronutrients are absorbed. Your gut is the epicenter of your health. So you want to know about the environment and you want to know about the structure and function. And this will be revealed in the FIT 176 plus gut panel or gut barrier panel. Perfect. Well, thank you, Rob. That's a great way, place to finish. Uh, again, if anyone's got any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to contact KBMO. Uh, we're always happy to help. We've also got Dr. Valerie on staff now, who's uh, more than happy to kind of answer questions as well in terms of on individual reports. So again, we're excited to launch this, uh, this new test or the new barrier panel rather, uh, and uh, excited to hear some feedback from you in terms of hopefully how this will be uh, further enhancing uh, the treatment care that, uh, that you give you the patient population out there today. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Dr. Rob, for your time. Uh, and as I say, we're looking forward to uh, getting this out on September the 6th. So thank you very much indeed, everyone.